Hello, everybody. My name is John Cogley. I'm the owner of Daniel Smith. It's uh, my pleasure to be here at Fabriano Acarello. It's our seventh year. Um, it's wonderful to see new friends after the pandemic. And I'm very pleased to um, showcase two of phenomenal artists, Lauren McCracken from the USA and Nicholas Lopez from Peru. Who are, who are both Daniel Smith brand ambassadors and extremely proud of both of you. Thank you, John. You're, you're gonna... No, you're not. I'm gonna make it. No. Do introduce him. Well, you just got him. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is Laurie McCracken, who everybody knows, and he's so extremely famous and such an excellent painter. And here on my left is wonderful Peruvian uh, and my friend as well, Nicolas Lopez. So, uh, Nicolas he will talk and paint about his lunar black, whereas uh, um, Lauren will explain about uh, his McCracken black. So, now, Nicolas, uh, can you explain a little bit about uh, this color that you're going to use and how you use it and why you use it? In English, please, if you can. <laughs> Otherwise, I will translate. Nicholas, you can put, yeah. say anything you want. AV expert is coming. Hola, hola, hola. Ah, perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, Whew. I am so happy, really, for uh, come in here uh, another more time. Um, for me, it's very honor uh, in this moment, this position for brand ambassador for this uh, company because uh, my 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 purpose in the paint and the and the art it's uh, all the time is investigating. It's at the freedom of the ideas of the of the roads yeah uh, I look at these materials uh, for me um, um, I look at different position of the of the pigment of the materials of the of the water yeah I look at all the time use many video live uh, El John explaining explaining only for one drops of the water for me this is the, the magic of the of the of the, of the paint and here it's uh, the, be the the best master of the of the war of the of the art is the water. Yeah. Um, now I'm using this uh, palette, not maybe uh, uh, too much color, but different grays, different temperature of the of the shadow, of the light. So uh, for me, it's only this necessary for explaining my 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 thematic. My, my concept and these materials and the lunar black for example it's one uh, special pigment because uh, it's symbolic for me it's a freedom yeah it's uh, living living alone in, the, in my palette living alone in my, in my paper for me this is the first uh, rolled uh, beginning paint in these materials yeah <laughs> I'm sorry my English is not the, the best but <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bueno, muchas gracias para todos. Voy a ponerme a pintar, sí. Gracias a todos por venir aquí. This evening you're getting two for one. While Nicholas paints, you cannot imagine two antithetical artists up here, and you will see. You know, Nicholas uh, paints with dynamite. You know, he is the most energetic painter we know on the face of the earth. I am the antithesis of that. You know, if I paint about this much, that's, that's a day's worth of painting. I'm the ultimate realist. Uh, so it's, we just thought we'd put the, the yin and the yang together and bring them here this evening so you can watch a fabulous painter paint while I give you some technical aspects about a new Daniel Smith color. So go for it, Nicholas. So from time to time, the, the, the screen will be coming back and forth from Nicholas painting 
and uh, when I'm not talking, you know, and hopefully I won't talk too much, but you know how much I love to talk. Uh, my biggest influence in painting is the Dutch still life artist of the 16th and 17th century. And my favorite painter, my hero, is a, is a painter named Kalf, K-A-L-F, Willem Kalf. And the, the thing that has always, since I was 17 years old and knew the man existed, his black backgrounds have always fascinated me. So I started out, uh, remember I didn't learn, to, I only started painting uh, in watercolor the year I turned 60. So uh, sort of late in life to start there. So there's hope for everybody out there. Uh, so I wanted to develop a black background, and I worked off and on, and it was a disaster. So I just focused for a year on how to create a really dense black background. I tried layering, I tried India ink, I tried everything that you imaginable, and finally I hit on a uh, recipe. Uh, it included eight different colors. I mean, I started with a uh, mineral violet, and then I would add, what's, what's your other darkest uh, uh, paint in your palette? Prussian blue. And then I would add alizarin crimson. And then I would start adding all of the earth tones, English red earth. Uh, and this, this was before the Primatex, uh, that I was even aware of the Primatex. And so I was just adding all of these colors to make it this deepest, richest color I could and, and it, sounds like, it sounds a little crazy, but I also wanted it to be transparent, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. So I, I finally achieved this, and, and my paintings were accepted in the marketplace. I got in lots of shows, won some awards, was doing some teaching, uh, and then John and I became friends. And he and Catherine and I were talking about my, the black I was mixing, all that, and finally John looks at me one day and said, Lauren, we make five blacks. Why doesn't one of your blacks meet your criteria? And I said, well, John, this is the reasons. And I told him that, first of all, most uh, of the blacks that are out there have a really, really strong purple base to them. And here was my issue with the pur purple base. When you painted it out very, very thin, it became more and more and more purple. Well, if I'm painting the belly of a silver teapot and I want to start with dark and then I want to add water, add water, thin it out and come around to show that it's a round belly in the teapot, I don't want the, the front of the belly to be purple and the back of it to be gray. I want that gray to thin down and thin down and thin down. And we tried all of the Daniel Smith grays and none of them thinned down to the kind of gray that I wanted and needed. Uh, and then it became quite an adventure uh, because John called me about, uh, about a couple of months later. He had been thinking about this. And he asked, uh, he asked me, would I be interested in working with the scientist at Daniel Smith to, to create a commercially viable black that met all of my criteria? I, I, you know, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. You know, I, I just fell down on the floor just trying to say yes. And so it was such a delight. I mean, John's the nicest guy I know in the world, but his scientists are really, really smart, practical people. There's nobody in the world that knows more paint, more about paint than these guys. And they were so kind to me. I wrote out all my criteria. I wrote out all my little recipes. We got on the phone and they asked me questions and I did my best to answer it. And then they started mixing things and shipping to me. And then I would do my little test. Here were some of the early production tests and compared to uh, like neutral tint and, and lunar black. Lunar black comes out very, very purple if you're running out really, really, really thin. Now you, I doubt that you can actually see this. You think we can get this on camera? I on camera. Well, I don't know if we can actually, but you, you get a sense. And one of the things I want to point out while, while I got this piece of paper here, 
You know, John taught me this. He, he said that the best way to test a color is to put a healthy drop down here, supercharge your brush with just clean water, and get the tip of your brush in so the, 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 uh, the paint starts to go in liquid and this swoop it across. And so you get, and, and the reason, you, and you, as you do that, you press in on the brush. So what happens then? The water rushes out of the belly of the brush and thins the paint. So you've got the absolute darkest hue that comes out of that tube, and then you can run it out to as far as you want to. I'm, I have run these out uh, in other tests, you know, you can run them out, I can run them out all the way across a 30 inch sheet of paper, a full imperial, to get the lightest, lightest color. And that was a revelation to me because I was so used to doing a series of squares that got lighter and lighter and lighter. And, and, and I didn't realize how I was impacting the paint every time I did a square. The paint is showing you what it wants to do when you do it this way. And it's so much more useful, and I'm so grateful for John taking the time and just showing me this simple, simple thing here. So I want to stop here for a second, and I want to uh, be sure we've got uh, Nicholas's painting up here. Or, and I'm going to ask Nicholas if he wants to talk a little bit about what he's doing. If he doesn't, that's fine, because I can always talk. Nicholas, you have something you'd like to talk to the audience about while you're painting? Sorry. No? Good, good, good. That's great. Thank you so much. I just want to do a great frickin' frack here. All right. My goal is always to print, to paint, a background like this that is really, really deep, like you can just stick your hand into it. But I don't want it to reflect light because reflecting a lot of light just spoils the whole impact. And while we were able to perfect the color, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute, it ta it hap you have to know how to apply it properly so that it has a matte finish to it. But there's, it gets a little bit more fun and more interesting because even the finest Fabriano paper, uh, you know, the Artistico 300 pound uh, paper that I use, uh, I mean, it's a fabulous paper. I love it. And, and remember, I paint on soft press paper. Very few people paint on the soft press, but if you've never painted on soft press, it is my highest recommendation that you try soft press because it's the same long strand virgin cotton that all the other that all the papers are made of. So you can get your paint into those fibers. So if I want to make a soft edge on the belly of that teapot, I can get the paint to get down into those fibers and make it just as smooth and round and come back out showing the light reflecting on the belly of the teapot. Uh, but at the same time, if I'm painting wet on to dry, I can get the crispest line in here. And, and, and I, I illustrate that by how these crisp edges on these little bottles that are here. Uh, because uh, the, the, I'm not painting up one side of a hill and down the other. I can just paint like that and get the crispest line painting wet into dry. But here's the real fun of it. As I started to talk about all watercolor papers, the sizing doesn't get to every little pace place in the paper. So uh, I don't know, yeah, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a little white spot here that the sizing didn't create properly in the paper. The, uh, my British friends who watercolor call this a holiday. The paint took a holiday. Well, that's great, but in my black backgrounds, if you have a holiday, a white holiday, you can see that from across the room. 
You're doing a Cerulean's guy. You really don't care how many holidays you've got. So, the, so what I started doing just for a pure technical reason to find the holidays, I started putting an undercolor on, on where I was going to put the black on the paper. And it didn't matter. It was, didn't matter if there was a, a perfect uh, wash, you know, uh, it, it could be sloppy as, as long as I got a good coating on it so I could find the holidays. You find a holiday, is it a, is it a disaster? Heck no. It's just it's probably because it has a little bit too, size, too much sizing in that little bitty pinhead of a dot. You just take a wet brush and dissolve it and it's gone. But you got to find it first. And so then what I do is I let this dry perfectly all the way. And then I paint my black over this background. And I'm going to, and this is why I wanted the paint to be uh, transparent to a slight degree. One of the things that, it, that is magic about watercolor is that it doesn't matter how many layers of color you have, the light goes through all of these layers. It first bounces off the top layer, and that goes to the retina in your eye, faster than you can blink. But the light goes very, very quickly through all the layers you've got in the paint and reaches the paper, and then bounces back up through all those colors, and when it bounces back up, it picks up all those colors. And this happens so fast, your eye doesn't realize it's happening, so you end up feeling all the undercolors, but you really don't see them. And, and so that was the thing that I discovered in doing this. So having the black slightly transparent, I can shift the warmth or the coolness of every painting I'm doing by what I do the undercoating with. If I've got a, a painting, and I, I, this is a really good example. The star of the show, in this little painting, it's this little snuff box right here. And it's very, very warm against these blue canning jars. So I wanted your eye to really focus on the snuff jar. So that's why I used a little quinacridone mixed with Aussie red gold as the underpainting here. Now, if I hold this up again, can you see the quinacridone gold? But when you're looking at it and you get a sense of it, the, the paint is much warmer and you feel the warmth because that, that, those warm, warm colors are laying in there behind the black and the black doesn't obscure how your eye registers all of the colors. So now, if, if I'm painting just silver and some crystal and I want to really reinforce the coolness of the metal of the silver, I might do a thalo blue red shade under here. And it just makes everything in that painting look cool and stiff and, you know, the way you want silver and crystal and that sort of thing to be. Uh, but if you want, and, it, and there's any step in between there. I have about five colors that I use as an underpainting. A lizard and crimson permanent is one. If, I, if I've got a really nice, rose-colored rose in that painting somewhere, I'm going to want you to, your eye to, to be comfortable moving to that. So I'll do a red undercoat so that emphasizes. On the other hand, if I have an orange in the, in the painting, I may even do a purple in order to get the contrast of the two colors so your eye is brought to the oranges in the color. So there are a lot of scientific ways you can influence the viewer in bringing up the quality of the painting. Now, I have a lot of people that have come up to me and said, well, Lauren, I followed all your instructions and it still looks like a snail crawled all over my painting. That's okay, I don't need it. I just, that's fine. Thank you, sir. Not only a great artist, but a really helpful friend. I mean, you can't beat that combination. So I'm going to show you how to apply the McCracken Black, which John calls me one afternoon, and he says, uh, he said, Lauren, we got to name this paint. 
and we got a lot of names, and we're sort of thinking it has to have your name in it. And I said, well, gee, that'd be fabulous. He said, well, do you want it to be a Lauren Black or a McCracken Black? I said, the alliteration of McCracken Black just sounds right to me. As a Scotsman, we like all those Ks. And so that's why it's McCracken Black. So you've noticed as I've gone around this conference, I just introduced myself as McCracken Black. So anyway, all right. Here's my black. You have, you, all of you have a tube of this in your, in, your, in your pouch. And if you haven't picked up your pouch uh, at the entry out there, be sure you get your pouch so you get your tube of McCracken Black. So I've got my McCracken Black in here, and I put a little bit of water in it because I wanted to wake up the pigment. You can't paint with, with the, or you shouldn't be painting with the, uh, the pigment that just comes out of the tube. And uh, the thing I'm not able to do here tonight, but it is my strongest recommendation of my entire presentation, paint with warm water. The second rule of thermo, the second law of thermodynamics, I know you remember this from high school chemistry. Don't tell me you don't. You can tell me, anybody tell me what the second law of thermodynamics is? You get another tube of McCracken Black. No, of course you don't. The second law of thermodynamics says that solids tend to go into a liquid the higher the temperature. All of you people that have cooked anything, rice or anything, you put the water on, you get the water hot, then you put the pudding or the rice, and it, and it goes into a liquid and starts cooking and all that. The same thing is true of paint. Now, I went to John's uh, scientist and asked them about the second law of thermodynamics, and being the honest guys that they are and friendly, they said, well, you know, we never thought about it, but there's no reason that it shouldn't work. <laughs> so, so what I've done here is I've started to wake up my paint. Now, this is the tool I use to transfer my water to my palate. It gives me total control of the amount of water I put into my palate. This is a batiking tube, B-A-T-I-K. It, it puts resist on fabric if you're dyeing fabrics. Uh, but this is the best because if I only want a dot, I can do a dot. If I need a half an inch, I can do a half an inch. It's the only thing I've ever found that gives me total control of how much water goes into, uh, onto my palate and into solution. I'm going to use a... I typically would use a uh, probably an eight uh, uh, round in a great big painting. Uh, I just happened to grab uh, an Escoda Versatile. Remember, this is a synthetic. It's a fabulous synthetic brush, and I have a number ten here. And so I'm going to mix this paint till it's about the consistency of really good Greek yogurt. It, you don't paint it thin. It's got to be really, really thick. But it's got to be th thin enough to spread evenly. You okay, Nicholas? It's okay. Good. We're a heck of a team. All right. So I'm going to start. I've got the tape all the way around. You start in one corner and you start painting with this really, really thick paint. And as it starts to spread, you start scumbling. Scumbling is an old uh, drawing technique where you're shading uh, an object to get uh, nice shadows. Like you're drawing an egg, you scumble to get those curvy, uh, uh, round shapes into the egg. And so I'm just scumbling here, and I'm leading out a little bit at a time because very quickly here, this back in here is going to start drying and you can feel the tug on the brush. And that tells me that you're doing it right and then you continue to push out. Now, one of the things I have to be really, really cautious about here, once you start, you can't stop. 
Because if I stopped right now and just let that dry, and I came back later, what would happen? I'd have a very noticeable line on there, just like any other wash you ever put down. So you have to keep the paint moving constantly. So, you know, you got to take the dog out early. You can't answer the telephone. And if your wife calls you, you just say, darling, I'm busy. So you just keep painting and keep painting. And you're coming back in here. I'm beginning to feel the drag on my brush back in here. So I know it's working. It's, it's going to be shiny for a while in that. So I keep coming and keep coming. And so you just keep doing that. I'm not going to do much more of this because I want to just get enough of it covered so that you'll see how mad it gets as it tries. And one of the things we're trying not to do is paint the paint on. Because if you do a brush stroke, you leave a variance in the thickness of the paint. And as John has taught me, what happens is the ox gall in the paint rises up and finds the, th the thickest part of the paint and rises up to the surface. And so it ends up creating a, high, a shine there. Looks like a snail crawl right down the edge of that brush stroke. But if I break it up, back in here, I don't have any, it, 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 both, it also evens out the paint, so you don't have a place for the ox gall to rise. Now, what am I trying to do here? It should be obvious. Everybody knows that every photographer's best friend is black velvet, because black velvet does not reflect any light. It absorbs all the light. You've got thousands of little bitty threads, every one facing in a different direction, so the light goes into those threads, gets trapped. I'm just loving watching out of my left eye here. <laughs> uh, don't I wish I could do that? Uh, but the light goes in and gets trapped. In that. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm creating a really rough surface that has no direction to it. So don't get trapped in trying to do this. Every stroke you make needs to be in a different direction because you're creating a very smooth velvet finish so that when the light hits it, it gets absorbed into that rough finish and cannot reflect the light back. So I'm not going to, but, but as you can see, it takes a while. On a, on, a, on a full sheet painting where I've got the whole background, it could take two to three hours. So, you know, go to the bathroom early, get all that stuff out of your way, because once you're committed, you're committed. Uh, you know, even a small painting like this, it's probably an hour to apply all the black, even into a small area like that. But I hope you can see here how matte this is. There's no shiny uh, space on here. And on, on this one, it's starting to dry. There's a little bit of sheen on it. But in 10 minutes, that sheen, that, that little black area is going to be just like this, just as matte as that can be. It ain't difficult if you know how to do it, right? Isn't that the mantra of, of, of watercolor? If you, you know, I, I'm just amazed how many people around the world walk into a store and they buy two cheap brushes, they buy a little plastic palette, they, they, they buy six tubes of the cheapest watercolor you can imagine and then a, a roll of a typing paper and they go home and they want to teach themselves how to watercolor. You know, think about it. If you wanted to be a printmaker and you wanted to do how to do etchings, would you go into a store and buy a small piece of copper, some sulfuric acid, some printing ink by Daniel Smith and some... Uh, some uh, print paper and go home and, and do yourself an etching? Heck no, you'd probably explode your kitchen before it would happen. Watercolor is just like that. It's not something you can just sit down and do. In the uh, mid-1900s, during the Victorian era in uh, England, the great watercolorist of the time, James Millaud William Turner, John Constable, we think of all these people as being oil painters, but they were fabulous watercolorists. And then you add 
to that, the John Sell Cotmans and the people who just did watercolor, they got together, they were all members of the Academy of Art in London, and they codified what you need to do. There are 12 different things you need to master to be a watercolorist. A continuous wash, a graded wash, a broken wash, being able to paint wet into dry, wet into wet. All of these things you need to be able to do before you can watercolor. So I encourage each of you to go home and look at a really good book that has all those steps in it and be sure you've mastered all of those before you try any of the things we're talking about here. There's, there's, there are, you couldn't write enough encyclopedias to cover everything you can know about watercolor, but there are certain things you know, you need to know, you must know, if you're going to be able to paint with any real facility. And one of the great things I will point out, I mean, we're seeing a master of just creating mystery out of watercolor, but I'll guarantee you that Nicholas Lopez knows how to do a wash probably better than I do. He's mastered all of those things. Now he can do move into the experimental side. He just didn't start by buying, being a master uh, experimental artist like we're seeing here and creating all this magic. He went through all the steps the rest of us had and then branched out into it. I got trapped in realism and I'm delighted with it. I don't have any problem with it, but I'm at the other end of the scale. Are you having fun, Nicholas? <laughs> yes, yes. Of course he is. Of course he is. <laughs> You know, my mantra is if it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing, and there's no more fun that you can have than watercoloring. I'm going to get some of this cracking black out of here before it starts reaching up into the ferrule of this fine brush. Now, I'm going to step out of the way and let Nicholas take over the stage and let you enjoy the master of finishing this painting. Thank you so much. hablar un poquito también, pero en español. Gracias. Sí, puede. Sí, dale. Pues eh, el, mi acuarela también siempre pasa por diferentes procesos. Son más eh, emocionales que visuales. Siempre estoy tratando de, de equilibrar las emociones en base a los volúmenes, en base a la forma y en base al... al a, um, the, my watercolors always go through uh, a very emotional process, not only color, more than technical. And uh, some of the emotional... ¿Puedo repetir lo de las emocionales? ¿Lo has dicho? ¿Lo último? Sí, mi trabajo se basa un poquito más en las emociones de los espacios que vengo trabajando, no solo not only on the technical space, but uh, on the emotional spaces within the painting. Siempre estoy uh, usando el, el agua como medio todo el tiempo. Uso pinceles, pero dejo finalmente que el agua termine de hacer lo que tiene que hacer. So I use brushes, but actually my basic tool is the water. So I allow the water to do what it has to do, to finish the work. Siento que lo gestual del agua eh, es mucho más fuerte de lo que uno puede dar. Entonces me gusta darle más énfasis al agua antes que a mi trabajo, antes que mi mano. I think that the water is more powerful than any tool, and so I like to allow it to do its own job, more, much more than what I can uh, achieve. Siempre intento sentir cómo está yendo la presión del agua para ver si es la suficiente, si es la que se necesita. 
Por esa razón es que pongo muchas veces la mano antes de, del papel. So he puts his hand in front of the paper uh, to feel the, if the pressure of the water is the right one. And uh, that, that helps him to, uh, with his creation. He has to be one in relationship with the water. También me gusta esperar su tiempo, me gusta trabajar con su, con su ritmo, eh, porque creo que eh, lo que yo puedo dar siempre es una parte, un, un, no es el todo de la, de la pintura. Eh, espero mucho también del agua, siempre en, entramos los dos con, con la misma intención. So we, uh, me and the water, we both enter with the same intention, and sometimes it can give much more than what I can give. Entonces siempre es, siempre es un un azar casi, andar como una, como una cuerda floja. Pero me encanta eh, estar en este, en este riesgo porque es cuando más se siente, más se, 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 la adrenalina de, de, de poder considerar eh, lo que pueda pasar. Todo eso definitivamente es eh, suma y, y son parte de la obra también. So, I, uh, I like to give uh, watercolors their time and uh, this even makes me feel, or makes the work feel like you are at an edge, but I love to be on this edge. It could be, it could fall either uh, to the right or to the left. It could go well or it could go wrong. But this edge, feeling that I am on the verge of success and failure, this is what really excites me and gives me the adrenaline that I need and also the feelings. Siempre, siempre me preguntan que por qué solamente uso un negro, por qué solamente uso un, un color o, o un, un tono. Esa pregunta siempre es frecuente en mí y me gustaría también respondérselas a ustedes. Seguramente alguien se hace esa pregunta ahora. Uh, many people ask me why I use only black or why I use only this uh, monochromes, this only one color, and I would like to reply to that question to you as well. Mm. Yo, yo siento que la pintura uh, al margen de transmitir lo que podamos eh, competir con la, con la, con la realidad. Eh, tra creo que también es necesario que transmita emociones, que transmita sensaciones. Eh, y esas sensaciones yo las veo mucho más claras, mucho más coloridas en negro. So, uh, uh, the, the painting not only has to transmit uh, the technique, but also the emotions. And for me, I can see much more many many more um, um, colors in the monochromes in the black mm. than if I used color, then I would be a bit lost. Porque me, me interesa los elementos, me interesa la forma, me interesa el carácter, me interesa lo que siento al ver, no, no me interesa si tanto la pared o los elementos tengan un color determinado. Tengo unos colores que me apoyan, que me ayudan, pero no quiero luchar contra esa, con ese cromatismo, sino quiero intentar eh, representar lo que eso ha, sent, ha sentido, ha, ha, ha tocado hacia, en mí. Hacia ti. Eh, he likes to represent not exactly the literal um, texture or the literal effects that are on a certain object, but the effect that these elements have on me, and that's why I need the black. Esa es una parte, gracias. Ya está. Voy a, voy a, voy a terminar esto. Muchas gracias, gracias. No, todavía. Ten minutes, ten minutes, yes. Pero puedo, pero puede, puede, podemos. Todavía no. He needs ten more minutes to finish. And after he's finished, if you want to, if you have any questions, I would like to ask him. Or Laurie.
terminé, pero el agua sigue trabajando. ¿sí? Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Hello again, everybody. I wanted to thank both Nicholas and Lauren, and most importantly, thank all of you. It's wonderful to see you all after seven long years. Um, so thank you very much for joining us all today. Uh, do any of you have any questions for, for Nicholas or for Lauren? Yes. What was the black you were using? Uh, Luna black. Uh, uh, a different grade, uh, 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 Pines Blue Gray, for example. Uh, uh, <laughs> in my head now it says um, Chris de Pain, Indigo, uh, Siena un poco, uh, Lunar Black, lun uh, Nero Azul de Lunar, ¿sí? y bueno, eh, eso es. Perdón, Luna, lunar, eh, lunar, black, lunar Blue. Lunar Blue. Lunar Blue. Sí. ¿Anyone else? Voy a sacar esto un poquito. Ok. Yes. Which, which paper are you using? And what weight? This paper is yes. uh, Fabriano. Ok. <laughs> All right. What? 300% cotton. Fabriano no, Artistico, 300, 300 grams, 100% cotton. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody.